Okay, hi, so I'm 16 and I'm from Mumbai, India. Ever since I was very small, I've had this passion for creating things, be it art, craft, work, painting. I did these when I was eight. And uh, I was vacationing with my family in the US at that time uh, in Florida. And that's when my dad gave me an option of buying a Lego Mindstorm kit or a Nintendo Wii. Well, tough decision for a kid, right? A cool gaming console or a toy you put together and build stuff with it. Well, I was an impulsive kid and we were at the Lego store at that time and I saw a robot walking around. So I'm like, I went and got the Mindstorm and it was the best decision of my life. So that's me when I was eight with the first humanoid Lego Mindstorm robot. And this literally changed my life because I kept building a lot of robots with this kit. And at eight, it was the best exposure I could get to technology. Post this, I kept taking help from the engineers at my father's office uh, to build whatever little projects I wanted to. And I kept following all these blogs and websites and learning new skills and projects from them online. And I, I got involved to such an extent that I built anything and everything I found fascinating on the internet at that time. And one such project was a 3D printer. So I built my first 3D printer when I was 13. And at that time, I was so excited that I even 3D printed a 3D printer on a 3D printer. <laughs> uh, so fun life, right? You're building things what you want to and you're doing what you want to. But I, I just started with ninth grade at that time and I was facing academic problems. Although I was going to school and topping my grade, I realized that there were, I didn't know fundamental concepts like least common multiple till grade nine. <laughs> Kids know it in grade six. And moreover, although I was from a Catholic school, my ability to speak English was deteriorating instead of improving. Ironical, right? So what was going wrong? It was all because of the wrong method of learning. In school, we were being taught how to rote learn the answers to score good grades in the exam. Well, that spoke really good of our memory, but what about our gain of knowledge? It was empty, right? So uh, I got frustrated because when I asked questions in school to my teachers, I didn't, have, didn't get answers and the questions were shunned away because the answers weren't in the textbook and I had to stick to the curriculum. Uh, this didn't stop me from finding the answers, but then why waste eight to 10 hours in school when you're only learning how to buy heart answers and write them in the exam? So I kept sharing my frustration with my parents and my tutor. And after weeks of debates and arguments with, that my parents had with my tutor, I finally quit school. Uh, okay, I quit formal schooling and not education. I still learned English, mathematics, sciences, economics, business studies, just like any other ninth grade kid. And since I spent six hours actually studying of my day, I didn't have any homework or assignments and I could do whatever I wanted to. That's what I like to do was building technology. So since I had so much of free time, I started participating in hackathons organized by the MIT Media Lab. And I'm here today to share two projects that I did with uh, MIT at that time. So currently, visually impaired people read when the letters pop out of the paper. That's when they're printed in Braille. And this is done using Braille printers, which are really expensive. Now, the books which are available for reading are obsolete. So it's like someone forcing you to read a book of the 1800s because you don't have any other option. That's what they go through. Now, text-to-speech uh, text readers are alre already available. But imagine listening to a book like The Avengers in Stephen Hawking's voice. Um, so what we basically did is we created a device which accepted PDFs and text files which we read and converted the English to Braille and projected out of those six pins you can see there. Now, now these are Braille readers and they have these Braille cells on it. Now, you'd say something like this already exists. Why would you go and build another device like this with fewer Braille cells? Now, this costs thousands of dollars, making it inaccessible to people in developing countries. And again, it's completely proprietary software, so you need to buy their software and then use their software to do the tools. And since there's so many Braille cells, it's obviously going to be expensive because each Braille cell is expensive. So what we thought of doing is cutting down the number of Braille cells to one or two 
And we used a linear axis, which represented a sentence. So as this Braille cell moved along the sentence, it's like a cursor moving around your sentence. So the position of the cell was tracked, and whatever letter in English was present at the document there was converted to Braille and pushed out of a surface. So it costed us $100 to build and four nights compared to thousands of dollars. So this is basically reinventing Braille reading, right? The second project uh, I did is for, with a team, uh, a big team uh, in Jan 2014, was for cardiac health monitoring. So coronary heart disease is one of the leading causes of death around the world. Cardiac arrhythmia is a very fancy word for irregular heart rhythm. Now, monitoring cardiac, uh, to diagnose cardiac arrhythmia, you need to monitor a patient's heart rhythm continuously. Now, this can be done in two ways. One, by hospitalization, which is expensive, or second, by wearing this really good-looking and comfortable Holter monitor that you'd never want to take off. So you have to wear this for 72 hours, and that sends all your data to the small device. So what we did is we came up with something called Cardio24, it's an easy to install wearable, reusable ECG belt you wear. It's a simple wearable you wear on your lower chest. It records all your ECG data. It can send it to a smartphone app where your data is displayed in the form of an ECG signal. There's automated diagnostics running on it. And the data can also be shared wirelessly over the cloud to a doctor sitting in any part of the world. So that's what the belt looks like. You wear it on your lower chest. It's got non-sticky electrodes, so you don't even feel it. And that's someone wearing it. That's what the app looks like. And that's how much it costs. <laughs> so this is like entering a whole new paradigm in low-cost health monitoring systems. So apart from the research that I was lucky to be a part of with the Media Lab at their hackathons, I really wanted to push innovation in India since it's a developing country. Uh, and the only way I thought I could do it is by exposing kids from a younger age to technology as I was exposed. Now, I was lucky to be able to buy a Mindstorm at my age, but I don't think all kids are. And in India, it's extremely expensive. So I started this company called Shark Kids. And firstly, everything shark, because I love the creature a lot. You'd see more sharks. And what Shark Kids basically does is we design and sell these low-cost do-it-yourself kits, where unlike Lego, uh, where you have plastic parts you put together. Here you have actual PCBs and components that you're putting together and making different cool projects. So you gain electronics and technical skills while being able to create whatever you want to. So from a young age, being, getting access to tools like this is very important to be able to push innovation. And all of this is priced under 20 US dollars compared to $300 for the Lego Mindstorm. So now, what was the problem? I wanted to get these devices out long back, but they're still not out. And I knew what to design. I knew what was going wrong. And the problem was that I was an inventor, but I didn't have the skill set to, to design products which would be manufacturable. And since I was an impatient kid, I kept looking for other people to do it. Now, finding that those people was hard, but I did find them. It took three months, and I found these people situated in a city far from mine who spent six months designing these kits and testing them out from my rough sketches and designs. So the products are ready. Now, why aren't they out in the market yet? To shed more light on that, I'll introduce another project I did. Uh, it's called Shockbot 3D Printer. So I built my first 3D printer when I was 13. And ever since then, I saw, noticed that all the printers avail available in the market for desktop use were ridiculously expensive for the technology. They were buggy, they used to break down, they were unreliable. So because of all this, only a few people could gain temporary access to it because they broke down eventually. And 3D printers are tools which really help engineers and creative people to bring their ideas to action really quickly. And to give access to everyone, give 3D printing access to every engineer and creative person, I started Sharkboard 3D Systems where we looked at creating low-cost, reliable desktop 3D printers, which anyone could buy and use, and which would cost one-tenth of what's available in the market uh, at the $3,000 price tag. 
So again, the problem was I didn't have the skill sets to build a product. I could build 3D printers, which were uh, open source. I could change things in them. I knew where things were going wrong. But to build a sustainable product, which was our goal, I didn't have the skills. And the funny part was that the people I had introduced to 3D printing years back were already making millions of dollars out of their companies, and their products were out. But I still didn't have a team to build it. And this frustrated me. Again, so what went wrong? I made a few mistakes. And I'm here today to tell you about those mistakes. The story was just to reach here. <laughs> the first mistake, I took up too many things. The Brailler, Cardio 24, Shark Kit, Shark Pod, 3D printer, and my education. <laughs> the second, I didn't realize that the crux of my problem was my lack of skill set and academic knowledge. And we all talk about the Mark Zuckerbergs and the Steve Jobs of the world, but what we don't realize is that their time was different, and they hired other people to do their job. I couldn't do that at 15. Third one, I spoke about these products while they were still in their novice stage at Asia's largest TEDx conference. This increased a lot of stress on me from media people. I got thousands of emails in a year asking about these products. I kept shunning them away, but for how long could I do it? And the fourth biggest mistake I made is shifted focus from my studies to technology. So where I used to study six hours before, I started studying for three. And this was hurting me more than I could imagine. So after months of frustration, I realized that the best thing I could do for myself is hand over these projects to responsible people, quit what I can, and get back to a structured and focused education. Because learning more would eventually help me build these things myself in future. So I joined back, I returned back to school for my 11th and 12th grades, and I'm pursuing the International Baccalaureate program in a school in Mumbai. Now, the International Baccalaureate isn't hard, it's just a very rigorous board. So it takes up most of my day, leaving me with very little time to do anything else. So I could choose between building tech or sleeping. And so I quit Cardio24 and the Brailler project, and there are people handling shock kits and shock board 3D systems now. And I hope they'll get the products out to people really, really soon. So quitting school, quitting college, and starting entrepreneurial projects is very glamorous. And it may have a lot of positive gains in the short run, but earning money wasn't the only thing I wanted from my life. And thus, I'm going to spend the next few years learning and understanding what I want to. So just a few things I'd like to end with. One, learn for yourself. Don't learn to show other people your degrees. It's not worth it. You have one life. Second, <laughs> just do what you want to do and learn what you want to. And third, there are millions of problems the world faces today out there. And all of you are extremely knowledgeable and brilliant people who can reduce the number of problems out there. So do what you can, look at those problems, and I'm pretty sure you can reduce that number down. And you have the power to build and create things. And just like Spider-Man's Uncle Ben said, with great power comes great responsibility, you have the power to change these lives. So why wait? It's your turn to change the world. Thank you. <laughs>